the last great health scare of the 20th century, is being played out on a global scale. Most countries are affected. And it seems the new dawn of genetically modified foods has arrived too early for the public to stomach. Claims that Frankenstein foods will feed the starving in the next millennium have been shot through by the murky workings of big business. Amidst the anti-GM public backlash, there's a growing suspicion that the world's food producers have moved into the realms of mad science, where we have become their guinea pigs. Southeast England and the Royal Norfolk Shire. It's part of a grand British farming tradition. But amidst the pomp and ceremony, the spectre of GM foods is threatening to divide the farming community. Advocates believe it's the way to higher production levels, while traditionalists fear the unknown. Nobody at the moment can say that um, a crop is safe, the GM crop. Well, hello, Chris. Hello. Local hello, sugar nice beet grower nice Chris Skinner is a right? vocal opponent yeah, of GM I, technology. I was talking about you this morning. Oh, dear. I was. I don't we're farmers, we're professional growers, and we don't know and understand all the scientific reasons, but we need to rely on a scientist to tell us what's OK and what isn't. Over at the cattle ring, a very different view. Grazer and corn grower William Brigham sees genetic modification as the only way forward. Well, I think there's, uh, by and large, farmers are in favour of it because, uh, generally speaking, they see it as something that uh, could put us out of business if our competitors throughout the world have an advantage that we don't have. Across Britain, the debate over GM foods has caused chaos for food suppliers. Consumers call it Frankenstein food, and they've voted with their feet. It's an issue which has united people from all walks of life, and even fired up the normally placid middle class. Um, we're here because we disagree fundamentally with this technology of, of recreating the natural world. And he's not alone. Eco-activists have taken up the GM mantle with devastating results. Eco-warriors in contamination suits have made raids tearing up GM crop trials. One man is primarily responsible for firing up the public feeling, and that's GM scientist Dr. Pustai. If you uh, release something to the general population and it is not being properly tested in advance, then it is the human population which is taking the place of the guinea pigs. Dr. Apart Pustai has a long experience in British research science, enough to win him a £1.6 million project to study the effects of genetically altering food. At first, he was in favour of the technology. Well, I thought that at the time that it was a, a, a very good uh, way into um, more uh, pr the production of more food. But Dr. Pustai's enthusiasm soon turned sour. Rats fed on a diet of genetically modified potatoes were suffering from immune deficiencies. I did my, what my conscience was telling me. My conscience was telling me th that uh, uh, my concerns somehow will have to be made known to the general public. Soon after dropping his bombshell, Dr. Pustai was sacked and his equipment was confiscated. There were cries of a government GM industry conspiracy. Although Pustai's research had been terminated, it had done enough to stir the nation's concerns. Part of being a farmer is that hopefully one day your children can take over, so you want to leave it 
as it is was left for me with all these lovely trees planted the woods the wildflowers the birds that are here and so it's a kind of living heritage now chris is worried There's this heritage might here be as well risk. as growing the crop so we're you know, we've got an important job he to, to look after this. This is experimental really sugar beautiful beet on his landscape. This little has been tested bit here, prior to British release, trees. and Chris is worried a puff of wind could infect his own crops. The worrying thing about pollen is that you cannot control it it will go round the world. It really is spectacular in the way it travels, so it can contaminate or pollinate crops, if you like, at huge distances. The British are almost impossible in that respect. They always think that if anything is done, it has to be done in secret. The vocal Dr Pustai soon found himself at the firing line. The British Royal Society mounted an investigation into his work. And they concluded that the studies were so flawed, and I'm quoting now from their report, in design, execution and analysis, that no conclusion should be drawn. Regardless of the veracity of Pustai's research, the GM industry had taken a body blow. Despite the setback, the scientific community still viewed genetic modification as a major breakthrough. Instead of crossbreeding plants from the same family, scientists could now swap genes between unrelated species. The potential benefits are seemingly enormous. Tomatoes with a fish gene to resist the cold, seedless citrus fruit. The list is endless. Monsanto, good afternoon. Would you mind holding, please? Thanks, Natalie. The US Bye. multinational Monsanto, Monsanto are the world leaders in biotechnology. In 1996, their Australian division bought their GM products to Australia for the first time. They began by targeting the cotton industry and produced Australia's first commercial GM crop. But Monsanto's entry into Australia was not without difficulties. There are sections of our uh, membership, uh, sections of the Australian cotton industry that, that have expressed real uh, concerns of, with the way Monsanto has, has dealt with our industry, and uh, and I can't disagree with that uh, with that position. Monsanto, an Australian government research body, and the cotton industry joined forces to defeat one of cotton's most destructive pests, Heliothus. Bringing the bug under control could guarantee the cotton industry's future. But few guessed at the powerful position Monsanto was quietly manoeuvring itself into. The government research body and Monsanto shared the research, but Monsanto had a monopoly over the gene technology, and that allowed them to fix the price the cotton seed was sold to farmers at. There are still people out there who are, who are hurting uh, from Monsanto's pricing actions from the first two years, and, and believe that um, Monsanto screwed us as an industry in that regard. Uh, and I'm not going to disagree with that. Peter Korish was one of the first to grow Monsanto's cotton, but he and other farmers were disappointed. The cotton didn't perform as well as they had hoped, and for two years, they argued with Monsanto. They blame management of the, of the technology, they blame the climate, and, uh, and again, because it was very new technology, we did not have a, a strong response in that regard. However, after two years, it became very evident that the, the product just wasn't as effective against Heliothus as what had been originally claimed. The first year of commercialisation, there will always be those who, who didn't feel that they got their money's worth, and there are those that were very, very satisfied. I think if you uh, talk to most growers now, three years out, they're pretty happy with the uh, product. But three years on, the relationship between farmers and Monsanto is far from harmonious. In some cases, there's open hostility. I'm aware of people who have actually boycotted Monsanto products uh, as, a, uh, I suppose, a, um, a retaliation for Monsanto's pricing action. GM cotton was just the beginning. When Monsanto's genetically modified soya beans arrived in 96, it uncovered a gaping hole in Australia's food regulatory system. 
the GM shipment caught government and industry totally unprepared and cast doubt on the independence of Australia's food regulator, ANZFA, ANSFA. Now, the role of ANSFA is not to be uh, a supporter or an opponent of GM foods. Our role is to protect public health and food safety. Then it emerged there were few laws in place which would have covered Monsanto's entry. At that time, what kind of regime, regulatory regime, was in place? That's before my time. I'm not certain of the answer to that question. I can't answer that question. I wasn't sitting in this chair at that point in time, and uh, I'm not uh, fully acquainted with the historical area. There are two answers, really. One is we didn't have our act together in terms of the regulatory structures and uh, the hurdles that needed to be passed. The second answer is it was very convenient for us not to have our act together because it allowed all kinds of changes to the food supply to slip in without the kind of regulatory scrutiny that otherwise could have made it much more complicated. And that goes back to the core of regulatory responsibility. In fact, at the time, there was no specific law in place to regulate genetically modified food. Instead, Australian regulators were working on the assumption that GM food was the same as ordinary food. That was a policy borrowed directly from the US Food and Drug Administration. The argument that they use is that uh, a tomato is a tomato is a tomato, no matter what you do to it. I would argue that when you start crossing a tomato with a fish, that you in fact do end up with a different type of tomato and that you should therefore have more rigorous testing of that tomato before releasing it for general consumption. A few months after Monsanto's soya arrived, Australia's food regulators finally did put in place laws to regulate GM food. Monsanto applied for approval under this draft, for are known as Roundup Ready Soya Beans beans from plants modified to resist Monsanto's own herbicide. The regulatory application is based on their own research, and now opponents say it's Monsanto whose scientists are faulty. The studies that were done by Monsanto are regarded as being really quite inadequate. They were only very short-term feeding studies of about four weeks to very small numbers of experimental animals. As foods generally don't have to be tested. There was very few foods on the shelf that would have been tested, whereas the, the food products such as the grain from, or the beans from soybeans has been widely tested and that, uh, there is a wealth of data on that. And this data was submitted in the US, it was accepted there, it's been submitted in numerous other countries. At the heart of the issue is whether genetically modified food should be more thoroughly tested than standards require. Some scientists say it should undergo the same scrutiny as pharmaceuticals, with independent scientific review and lengthy human trials. But the GM industry and Monsanto disagree with this. Well, human testing is not done for uh, food products. And uh, I'm, discussions I've heard other people suggest that it would be extremely complicated, extremely time consuming. Many argue that because GM food is created in a lab, appropriate testing cannot be so easily eliminated. Normally in science, people who want to show that something is safe, um, such as a pharmaceutical drug, will write up their results and they'll publish it in the international literature so that everyone can have a look at it. Look at how they went about those studies and the results that they got. They'll critique them, they'll do their own studies, and as a result of all of that, you'll then get a body of knowledge about whether that procedure, that food stuff, whatever, is safe. That hasn't happened in this circumstance. While Australia's regulators were considering Monsanto's soya application, other multinationals were busy importing GM food. Genetically modified sugar, potatoes, corn, cotton oil, common ingredients in processed food. The supermarket shelves were being stacked with GM products and the regulators gave the chemical companies some nine months to register their GM foods for approval. But as the deadline approached, most of the companies ignored it. The life science companies, the Agrivos, the Monsantos, all of those people who were actually required to make the applications, some did, some were slow. 
We did everything we possibly could to get them to the table. But these are international companies. I guess we didn't figure high on the priority list. I was extremely disappointed with the attitude of the food manufacturers. And that, uh, that disappointment was clearly conveyed. What did you tell them? They, exactly what I've told you, that if they didn't comply by the, the new date, that was it. Certainly there was a tardiness on the part of some of the industrial and commercial interests in putting their applications in. We made that very, very obvious. But uh, earlier this well, it was year... More than, it was more than tardiness. It was nine months and only, only two actually applied. It, it, it was unfortunate that they didn't. I'm not going to sit here and try and defend the indefensible. It didn't happen. It was, it was certainly a, an issue of laxity. It was slack. Look, there was no doubt in my mind that the industry was uh, testing for testing ministers and saying, no, we don't want to do it. Uh, and there wasn't a hard enough line taken. In the end, the government food regulator, acting on the instructions of the state and federal health ministers, caved in. Rather than pull hundreds of foodstuffs off the shelves, the deadline was extended. The whole idea was to avoid sponsoring one of the, one of the biggest national recalls of products, putting companies in a very, very difficult position of uh, having to go back and trace and audit. But if the GM technologists had won the first battle in Australia, the global fight was just hotting up. Canada was one of the first and most vocal opponents of GM technology, and their farmers were becoming ever more concerned. Simply because these things are introduced without adequate research and without a really holistic look at what they might do, we're very cautious about GMOs. What most worried Canadian farmers was the commercial muscle Monsanto was now flexing. In their lawsuit against me, they stated that I uh, must have obtained uh, their canola seed or the Monsanto ready canola from uh, a licensed farmer or one or two farmers or from a seed uh, uh, outlet and so on. But uh, that was never, I've never done that because I've always grown my own seed. Monsanto was claiming exclusive rights to their GM pest resistant canola seed, regardless that seeds could be blown from one farmer's field into neighboring properties. Their scattergun approach to launching lawsuits were not only heavy-handed, but were seen by many as evidence that Monsanto was now too big to control. I think a message has to be sent to Monsanto that they can't keep doing to farmers what they have been doing by getting farmers to sign contracts, giving up their rights to grow a crop from their own seed, uh, having uh, inspectors or pl uh, former police officers come on to their land and be harassed and, and, and threatened that they might have growing round up ready canola. The things that canola won't do in a lab will do when Mother Nature gets a hold of it. And I think that's one thing that Monsanto never counted on. And I feel that Monsanto really got caught, and they got caught by Mother Nature. Genetic diversity is, is the whole story here. If you do not have a genetically diverse um, type of plant, then any little disease that comes along, any newly mutated insect that comes along, you name it, can wipe out um, a lot of crop, which again bankrupts farmers, but um, in the bigger picture, it bankrupts the planet. Back in Australia, farmers were coming to terms with another form of contamination. For honey producers like Greg Roberts, spring is the busiest time of the year releasing millions of bees to pollinate the first flowering canola. But this year, beekeepers are anxious. Nationally, over 100 hectares of GM canola are being trialled, and some of them are nearby. If Greg's bees wander into one of those GM canola crops, they could carry pollen back to the hive, and that might transform conventional honey into GM honey. Well, bees do forage uh, on canola crops up to four kilometres, so we do need to identify um, GMO crops. So the beekeeper himself does need to know whether uh, if the honey he's producing off canola isn't a GMO type honey. And it's not just the beekeeper's livelihoods which are at risk. 
the bees could also carry GM pollen over to neighboring farms and contaminate other non-GM crops. But the pollen will migrate, there will be contamination and it will build within a certain population. And this is, it may take a number of years for that contamination to show up, but it will happen. It's without question, it will happen. Some trial sites are located within several kilometers of ordinary canola crops and the beekeepers are being warned to play it safe. Well, there has been some threats, if I can call them threats, uh, from the organic farmers. They would sue beekeepers. Um, and that's the reason why I would advise beekeepers if this was a risk to stay away, not only from GMO crops till the, till the whole mess is sorted out, but also from the organic crops to give both sides a, a guarantee. The GM canola trials have been quietly running in Australia for four years, and there's little likelihood of them stopping. The oil produced from canola plants is big business, and the companies have sunk millions of dollars into the trials. In their eagerness to embrace the gene technology, the GM industry has left behind many who should have been its strongest supporters. Only now have the beekeepers woken up to the fact that they are in the front line of a new system of farming. Their customers are telling them they don't want genetically modified honey, but the beekeepers are vulnerable, at the mercy of government regulators and an industry that can't guarantee their honey won't be contaminated. It is possible. I'm not suggesting that it is not possible. I'm saying it is very unlikely and the probability is very low indeed. It is the fear that we do have, the unknown, that. Uh, uh, what is going to happen worldwide to uh, honey that is produced of agricultural GMO crops. While the government regulator has indicated the general area of the trial sites, the exact locations have been kept a secret. Despite assurances of the long-term benefits of gene technology, farmers still suspect the industry is misleading them. I think it's a terribly important decision and I don't think we're getting all the facts. I think we're getting a huge avalanche of pro-GM information and very little balancing information to counter, to counter that. And I think, we, you know, to, to, give, to take a rush decision to, a, to rush into it now could be putting us all at peril in the future as far as uh, how, we, how we're going to farm on in the future. I feel that uh, our farm organisations should have come and said, OK, what, what do you farmers how do you feel about this technology? But if the food regulators didn't ask the farmers, they certainly weren't prepared to inform the consumer about the safety issues regarding GM food. At the heart of this was labelling. Did consumers have the right to know what they were eating? food regulators, backed by the government, developed a strategy whereby virtually no GM foods would have to carry a GM label. It was a strategy doomed to failure. The government and the food regulator were not in favour of mandatory labelling of all foods. Only those substantially modified. Effectively, no labelling at all required in Australia, and the public weren't happy. As the GM multinationals settle back to lick their wounds and re-strategize, politicians around the world moved into overdrive, disassociating themselves from the GM industry. It had become too much of a political hot potato. At meetings around the world, the buzzword was now labeling. If people wanted labeling of GM foods, politicians would now have to comply. At this New Zealand-Australian meeting, they were at last doing the job of regulating the new industry. We finally got to uh, a unanimous position uh, that is for comprehensive labelling uh, of foods that are produced from gene technology or that are modified. But even after the ruling, the food industry is arguing it will be difficult for manufacturers to identify the origin of the ingredients they use. You won't get that overnight. And you're going to have to streamline the entire food production chain. You're going to have to segregate the whole system into one or the other. You're talking real dollars. 
real dollars to do that. And for what benefit? But shoppers at this UK supermarket see things a little differently. They don't want GM food and clearly see the benefits of knowing what not to buy. I mean, what's the point of putting wax on when you don't need it? I've been assured by the manager today that all this does not contain genetically modified food. Here, shoppers are informed by a Greenpeace representative. Now, what genetically engineering does is it takes a gene from one thing, such as a fish, this has been done, and implant it into another thing, such as a tomato. It would never happen in nature. But not everyone is scared by GM technology. William Brigham is one of the few farmers who is prepared to try out experimental GM crops on his land. I think some of them have been frightened by all the problems that have been and, and perhaps showed from it. But with supermarkets around the world pulling GM foods from the shelves, he knows he takes a great risk in continuing the trials. And then there are the eco-warriors. That sort of thing makes us only more determined to carry on because if you give up to that sort of threat, then you're giving in to anarchy. Crop is looking well, I think. Yes. I mean, uh, in fact, I think it's probably the best one I've got. Well, it's three weeks since I was here. Teaming up with a biotechnology company, William has planted six acres of a GM pesticide resistant corn. If successful, it will turn a healthy profit. We're doing, we're doing it for profit, uh, wouldn't, and, and uh, no one should, should think otherwise. And he's equally blunt when asked about the motives of the so called eco warriors. Well, I, I would ask that the same people should ask questions of the su supposed green environmentalists and ask them what their real motives are. And is the real motive of Greenpeace to fill their coffers for their next campaign? He could have asked them in person just a few days later. In a lightning raid, Greenpeace locked William out of his own field and destroyed the company's experimental corn. The white gown protesters, rather than being seen as fringe radical, have caught the public's imagination and encouraged the consumer to doubt the professionals. And I think scientists are dealing with dabbling in things that they don't know the outcome of. I really do feel that. The British government is under pressure to act over GM foods. The fact that they've had to acknowledge public support for groups like Greenpeace doesn't make it any easier. In the richly textured debate with its many problems, one of the biggest problems is, uh, if I may say so kindly, people like you uh, who have a media focus on it, who are unwilling to take on the media unfriendly thing of having an in-depth discussion of the real issues and want to hit on the spike of the moment. Dr. Pushtai, Prince Charles, the couple of media spikes that stick up in aberrant parts of the overall landscape of this discourse. With the demise in public confidence, the GM industry is desperate to stem its losses. Monsanto has made a U-turn on its policy of terminator genes. And they know that only by turning the public around will the all-important corporate world return to their cause. Right now, there are no direct benefits with this technology for consumers. And I think this is where one of the major issues are. The consumers are saying uh, they're not sure whether they really want this food. They don't really see any benefits in it. And that's, that's quite right. You know, the force of public opinion when it comes to a mass consumer product like food uh, is far more powerful than any scientific study. And although the force of public opinion, of course, is informed uh, by new information, whether it comes from scientists or uh, ethical folk or uh, community leaders or what have you, at the end of the day, uh, if the food industry does not listen to that public opinion, it chooses that path at its own peril. But while the debate over GM technology rages, many still see GM foods as an inevitable part of the world's food production line into the future. Well, there's one of my fellow farmers who's got a bet on with somebody, a hundred pound, that in ten years' time, well, that will be taken as the norm, and I personally tend to agree with that. In an attempt for governments and regulators to catch up with public opinion, industry is today paying the price for assuming no one would question their science.